Yes, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, welcome back to 228. Um, before we dive back into lecture, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, first thing is uh, just a reminder that tomorrow the computer science department is holding a student research day. Um, for those of you that are thinking about going to graduate school or pursuing a graduate degree, um, you're more than welcome to come and join us. I put the link, uh, I dropped the link into Teams for the schedule and the schedule contains a link to uh, the Teams for tomorrow. Uh, we'll be having a very prestigious uh, guest, uh, Tina Alicia uh, Rad, who will be talking about uh, tongue-in-cheek, just machine learning. She's not just going to talk about machine learning. Um, she will also be spending a little bit of time talking about uh, her journey through the various decades of artificial intelligence. And then uh, throughout the rest of the morning, uh, there will be talks given by various graduate students in the computer science department, in the Department of Mathematics. You're welcome to drop in a, at any time and, and hear any of the talks. Uh, more talks in the afternoon, and then I'm wrapping up with a talk on uh, Beyond Deep Learning at 3 o'clock tomorrow. So if you have any room in your schedule, uh, please do feel free to join us. And again, the, the link for the schedule and the Teams link is dropped into our team. Okay, um, hopefully most of you have at least had a look at uh, Deliverable 4. And uh, just as a reminder, you're going to be uh, creating the K nearest neighbor machine uh, learner, and you're going to be applying it to a data set that you download from the web, the IRIS data set. And then next week in Deliverable 5, you'll be adapting your KNN algorithm to work not with the IRIS data set, but to use uh, data that you've drawn off of the Leap Motion device. Any qu quick questions about Deliverable 4 for those of, the, of you that have had a look at that already? Any other questions about the deliverables? So far, so good? Okay, do remember to sign the attendance sheet and then we will return to uh, our lecture on design principles, which we are still continuing, but I promise we will finish that uh, today and move into a particular aspect of design that's, that's very important in HCI, which is uh, visual design. Okay. Okay, so uh, we are talking about design principles today, rules of thumb that we're trying to use to maximize the non-functional requirements usually associated with interactive systems. We're going to look at 12 of these uh, today. We looked at the first four last time and we ended with this idea of affordances. And this is an idea, just as a reminder, that comes from uh, psychology, which is that the way that the human brain makes sense of objects or systems out in the world is not classifying them based on their 3D shape or structure. We make sense of things we see in the world by thinking about or predicting the potential ways that we might interact with those systems. Um, these are not five pictures of chairs. These are pictures of very distinct objects which afford or project, uh, that advertise the affordance of sitting. Depending on what else is going on in the visual field or whatever larger context there is around the person, what they're trying to do, any one object like the tree stump on the right here may project different kinds of affordances. In this case, it's projecting the affordance uh, for sitting. In this case, it's projecting the affordance for providing energy or heat or comfort somehow to a human being. These are physical objects, but virtual objects can also project uh, affordances. What do these objects have in common? They all look kind of different, but they all project the same common affordance. What is it? Remember that a, an affordance is usually a verb, not a noun. They're clickable. So as Laura mentioned, uh, she mentioned an adverb, which is a nice uh, segue to the next aspect of affordances, which is 
they're usually they're suggesting some kind of verb, but they themselves are advertising an adverb. They are clickable. Um, these objects are sittable. These ones, uh, I don't know what the adverb is for that one. We'd have to we'd have to have to think about that. Okay, you'll notice that I have highlighted one object, which is uh, projecting the affordance of clickable or clickability. Same thing before. I'm keeping one of the virtual objects the same, but changing the overall context. What is the affordance that is projected by this uh, virtual object now, along with these others? So the, the cursor down here and the cursor here are not clickable anymore. What is this object, this object, this object, and this object? What is the common affordance here? Typing in words, exactly, right? So they're suggesting a particular interaction which in this case is, is typing in words. So again, depending on the context around any particular virtual object on the screen, it may project different affordances about what it will allow, what kinds of interactions it will allow with the observer. Okay. All right, so let's move on with these 12 design principles. Remember that we're thinking about rules of thumbs, th things we're gonna build into our system that will allow people Helping people will help people access, learn, and remember the system, blah, 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 and so on to safely and securely. So safety and security, um, these are not strictly HCI considerations, but they, they do come up because we need to be able to make, um, make these particular functions uh, clear. How can people do things safely and securely? So when you're designing an interactive system and someone is interacting with the system, you can approach safety and security from a reactive point of view, meaning we can allow users to make mistakes and errors and omissions, and then advertise an affordance on the screen or at least communicate to them how they can back up and undo their mistakes. Alternatively, we can come at safety and security from a proactive point of view where we're gonna try and build in constraints so that it's hard for users to make mistakes uh, in the first place. There are various kinds of constraints we can build in to do that. We might make potentially dangerous actions impossible or at least very, very difficult uh, to do. We might actively steer the user away from dangerous paths. If it seems that they are about to enter into a dangerous interactive with the system, we may seek confirmation once, twice, three times. Uh, however, by sort of hiding away dangerous potential actions, that means that these constraints, if we build them into our system, they are now potentially uh, antagonizing other design principles like visibility, which we talked about, which we talked about earlier, number one here, allowing people to see everything that you can do with the system. We might actually be trying to hide certain things. And it might also uh, impact with flexibility, which we'll talk about in a moment, which is allowing the user to do things in lots of different ways. In proactive safety and security, we're restricting the number of things that people can, can do. Um, Khan is asking if we, uh, we skipped a slide. Did we skip a slide? I think you're right. We did skip a slide. Thank you, Khan. Okay, <laughs> let me back up for a moment. We'll come back to safety and, and security. So five, six, and seven, uh, navigation. So if somebody is navigating a complex interface or a complex piece uh, of code, we wanna try and uh, add things to the screen, possibly affordances to allow people to see where to go and how to get there. What are different versions of virtual signposts on complex websites or complex applications? How is the user told where they are, where they can go from here, how to get from where they are to where they'd like to go? What are some of those virtual signposts?
Think about it, this uh, a menu bar, that's, that's an obvious one, yeah, so na a navigation bar. So think about your educational game. You're going to have somebody signing with their primary hand and possibly manipulating uh, a menu or, or visual components in three-dimensional space with their secondary hand. So they're trying to drive their educational experience with their secondary hand while signing or learning ASL with their primary hand. What might you draw in one part of the browser window that can be touched or manipulated by the secondary hand to help people understand where they are in the learning process of learning the 10 ASL digits? What might you draw there to help them see where they are and where they can go? So Shin mentions the, the help section, okay. How do we advertise the help section? How does somebody know how to get there? Progress bar, yeah. So again, remember our discussion about packed analysis. We're thinking about the activity. If we're talking about the example of the ASL educational game, they're trying to make progress on learning the digits. If I'm, if I'm learning, for example, one of the 10 digits, I'm practicing one of the 10 digits, but I'm getting frustrated, I'd like to move forward. How do I know whether I can move forward and how, how far forward? Perhaps I've already learned ASL and I'm just a little bit rusty. Instead of, instead of the system trying to teach me one digit at a time, I want to jump all the way to the ahead where it'll expose me to all 10 and I have to try and remember all 10. I'd like to jump to the end, so to speak. What might you draw here to tell the user first, can they do so? And if so, how do they do that? Can they skip ahead to the next digit to practice? Can they back up if they're getting frustrated and they're having a problem with signing three digits at any one time? Maybe we want them to be able to back up and practice just two digits or alternate uh, two digits and then go back to three digits. How are they going to know how to navigate your system? Related to that is this issue of control. So as they start to learn ASL in your system, who is in control of the progress of learning? Is it the system? Is the system going to dictate when new lessons about ASL digits are exposed to the user? Or can the user control that with their secondary hand? How do I know that? What might you draw to the screen to make that clear that I can seize control and advance to the next lesson or reverse to a previous lesson? Yeah, as Laura mentions exactly. So arrows, as we talked about earlier on, usually mention something about progress. Arrows usually represent something on a one-dimensional line. I'm at a more advanced lesson or an easier uh, lesson. Green means I can move forward or back. Grayed out means I can't move forward or back uh, yet. Exactly. Okay. Remember that when you're working with ASL, and if you're going to use the secondary hand for navigation, you actually have at your disposal three dimensions. I might be able to move forward to a more advanced lesson or back up to an easier lesson. What would it mean if I were to move my secondary hand left or right or up and down? Not that you need to exploit those additional dimensions for navigation and control, but you you could. Maybe I want to stay on the same lesson, but I want to do that lesson faster or slower. Okay. So uh, advertising who is in control at any one time is particularly important when I'm about to perform some action that's going to have some larger repercussion or uh, effect. If you've ever bought anything online, you know that it makes the system makes it very clear that if you go to the next step, your credit card is going to be charged. Okay, so in order to navigate and know how to seize control or let go of control and let the system guide navigation, we need to provide lots uh, of feedback in different forms as often as possible. If there's a blank screen and nothing is happening uh, on the screen with leap motion, I don't know where I am or who is in control. Either the device is broken, it's not, it doesn't see my hand, or it does see my hand and it's doing some internal processing and everything's fine. How do I know? But again, as I was just mentioning here with constraints, 
feedback can obviously ha uh, antagonize with some of these other design principles. Most importantly, the number one design principle, which we talked about last time, which is keep it simple. If there is too much feedback on the screen, so I am trying to learn ASL, but there is a bunch of things flashing over here and arrows turning green and then gray. I'm now looking at what's happening on this side of the screen and not seeing that, the, that I am signing the current digit incorrectly. So how do we provide feedback about how to navigate and seize and release control of the system without distracting the user from what they are uh, trying to do, what activity they are trying to, to carry out? Okay, now on to recovering constraints. As I just mentioned, we can approach this from a reactive point of view or a proactive uh, point of view. In the case, and again, we need to think about what is the activity that's being carried out. If it's uh, education, for example, with ASL digits, it's perfectly fine to let the user make mistakes and errors. In fact, we want them to make mistakes and errors. That's part of the way that you, that you learn. If we were to take a proactive approach to keeping the user from making mistakes as they're learning the ASL digits, that's probably not a good choice for that particular activity in context, which is learning how to do something. Of course, uh, in other cases, it does make sense to add uh, constraints. So let's take the example of uh, GitHub. So hopefully most of you have practice with Git and GitHub uh, at the moment. There are certain dangerous actions that you can take in a version control system like Git. And at GitHub, the website, tries to make those dangerous actions very difficult or near impossible. It steers the user or the casual user away from some of those dangerous paths. For those of you that are more familiar with Git uh, than others, what are some of those dangerous actions and how does the GitHub website steer you away from them? So deleting a repository is the most dangerous thing you can do, um, which kind of goes against exactly what GitHub is designed to do, right? So in this class, uh, if you're late submitting a deliverable and you send us an email saying, I'm sorry, I deleted all my code, that's not an excuse because that's what GitHub is for. GitHub is meant to make sure that you don't ever accidentally delete all of your code. Deleting a repo though, as long as you don't have a local version of your code on your computer, that is getting rid of all your code. Uh, as Prasuta mentions, um, the way that GitHub makes this very difficult to do is it asks you to type in the repo name right at the last step just before you delete it. So it's seeking confirmation. Um, it's also, uh, if you navigate the GitHub website, and be careful if you do this, you'll notice that deleting your repository is hidden away in some advanced, uh, it's, it's a hidden away in the menu hierarchy of the website. It's not right there on the repo page for good reason. We don't wanna accidentally click that. You'll notice that in a lot of other websites or applications, it hides, you know, delete the whole, quote unquote, delete the whole thing it's a hidden away in some menu hierarchy that only an advanced user would know how to how to find. Sarah mentions another potentially dangerous action in GitHub, which is merging uh, merge conflicts, or how to navigate merge conflicts, and for that you need uh, you need appro approval of one of the the developers. Yep, great examples. Okay. Okay, so uh, some of these now are a little bit more obvious. Uh, flexibility, style, and the last one, conviviality. So flexibility is the idea that for whatever it is the user is trying to do, we want to try and provide multiple paths from where they are, point A, to point B, which is completion of the uh, task. We want diversity in those paths. Some paths should be very long and contain multiple visible simple steps. Other paths should be shorter and contain few complex steps. What are some examples of software that provide long and short paths? Or what are those long and short paths in particular applications? Right, the most obvious one, as Oliver says, is keyboard shortcuts versus menu uh, options. 
Why build in this added complexity? Why build in all of these different paths? How does that relate back? How does adding in flexibility help with our four non-functional requirements? What does it do for us, assuming we build in these multiple paths? If we don't build in these multiple paths, more advanced users can be more efficient while still being open to new users. So we are broadening the accessibility of our system, right? So if we build a system that only has keyboard shortcuts, we are excluding uh, beginning users. If we do not include uh, keyboard shortcuts and we only allow menu navigation, then we are excluding or at least making our advanced users frustrated and they may find our system acceptable. Here's an application that's only for babies, it's not for power users, right? So two different demographics. What are some other multiple paths that support different kinds of demographics, not just advanced and beginning users? What are some other different demographics that may be supported by building in different kinds of ways to complete a task in an application? What are some software systems out there that support uh, a disability support? Okay, in what way? How does it, how do some popular software systems out there support uh, sighted and blind users, for example, or hard of hearing users? What are the multiple paths that are built in to support those that are challenged visually, auditorially, challenged in a motor uh, capacity? text to voice, colorblind modes. Colorblind modes is a great example. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, a significant minority of the population is red, green, uh, colorblind. Closed captioning, right? That was a big one for YouTube. That took a long time to get that right. It's still not perfect. Um, it's interesting to go back. I don't know how you would find it. You can go back a few years and see the early attempts at closed captioning in uh, YouTube. Not very successful. It's gotten pretty good now, right? Not a trivial thing to do, but very, very important. Okay, so style, again, this is back to the subjective side of human-computer interaction. People will find a system more acceptable and engaging if it's quote-unquote attractive, clean, harmonious. These again are sort of subjective statements. What is it? Can we be objective now? What are some aspects of the visual appearance of an application or a system that makes it seem to the user to be attractive, clean, and harmonious. What makes for a good-looking website compared to an ugly one? or one that is not acceptable or engaging to use. Having a lot of white space, not too much packed in text, not overwhelming. So my favorite example of this is actually the, the GoDaddy website. GoDaddy uh, allows you to, to make websites and domain names. Uh, GoDaddy used to be notoriously cluttered, like you see on the left. And this is a screenshot of what GoDaddy looks like uh, today, right? So there's been this convergence on very, very simple, clean websites with a lot of, of white space. So it's a complete 180 from the way things used to be done on websites, where the idea was we want to make sure the user can see everything that, that we make available. Okay, if it's on a phone, making sure it's mobile responsive, right? So attractive, clean, and harmonious might also have something to do with the speed at which it responds. And that takes us into the 12th and final design, uh, design principle, which is conviviality 
or politeness. And politeness is kind of in quotes because I don't know how a non-sentient piece of code can be polite. But it can give the impression of being polite. And for most users, that's enough. Remember that we talked about how people bring their interactions with the real world to bear on their expectations about the virtual world. We have certain ex expectations when we enter into a social exchange with another human being, and politeness is the social, uh, the social grease that allows that allows social interactions to flow more freely. We uh, unconsciously respond to software that also seems to be polite. We're more willing to interact with software that seems to be responsive to us. Responsive could simply be respond quickly, but it could be something more subtle. Like, for example, the system becomes more passive and allows us to uh, uh, assume more control when we show aptitude. So that means that the system has to be able to infer from the interaction that we know what we're doing and it should quietly step into the background and let us take control. Alternatively, if we're showing that we don't know what we're doing or that we need help, it should spring to the front and take control and advertise function or help us through a process. What are some examples of systems um, that clearly show that they are rapidly becoming passive and allowing us to take over when we demonstrate control? Or alternatively, that jump to the foreground and help us when the system infers that we're having problems? So somebody mentioned uh, help before. So if I'm if I'm confused, uh, I can go looking for the help screen or where to type in a question mark. But what if I can't find the help screen? What if I'm randomly moving around the screen and I'm indicating that I that I need help? So as Nolan mentioned, um, detecting the amount of time of inactivity is usually a good indicator that the user needs help. And at that point, maybe arrows show up on a screen after a certain amount of time. That's a good design principle or rule of thumb for certain activities. For other activities, that's particularly annoying. What are some activities in which you don't want arrows to jump up if there is inactivity for a, a span of time? As usual, it depends on the activity and context. Obviously, in YouTube, watching a movie, we don't want, we don't want arrows uh, appearing on the screen. What are some examples of the opposite here? What, what are some examples of systems that move into the background if the user shows aptitude? The user has more control when they're demonstrating that they're good at the system. They're good at using the system. So a lot of, uh, a lot of modern uh, video games come with a complex tutorial at the beginning and they will at least try to force you through some other tutorial. But if you demonstrate aptitude, there's usually, either you can, there'll be something that will jump up on the screen showing you how to click and uh, jump to the end of the tutorial. Or better yet, it's detecting that I know what I'm doing and I'm responding to the tutorial faster than someone could possibly respond to the tutorial if they were reading the tutorial and it'll jump forward uh, on its own. Okay, so uh, at the bottom here, there's kind of some tongue in cheek uh, descriptions of polite software. So when you get to user testing and you ask your users to describe their, describe their interaction with your system, it would be nice if they kind of anthropomorphize your system. They talk about it as if it's a person and particularly a polite person. Polite software should be interested in me, the user. It should be deferential to me, as we were just talking about. It becomes passive if I show that I know what I'm doing. It's forthcoming. So if I need information or the system infers that I need information, it provides it. The system has common sense. That one is a little tricky. What does it mean for maybe not the software system to have common sense, but for it to seem like the system has common sense from the point of view of the user? 
Or an easier way to think about this is what are some examples of software that doesn't seem to have common sense? It should know by now not to dot dot dot, but it keeps doing that. What are some examples of systems that have common sense or don't have common sense? So going back to the example of a tutorial, if there's a new system and it brings up a tutorial and I wave the tutorial out of the way or I click I don't want it and I move on to another part of the system and it brings up another tutorial that's part of that system, I wave that away and go to the third component of the system and it pops up another tutorial or a pop-up window for the third time, now I'm frustrated. I made it very clear to the system that I don't want tutorials or pop-up notifications. It should be learning from me and have common sense. Okay, for this particular user, they just want to be left alone. It should anticipate my needs. This one is particularly difficult because it conflicts with control. We're going to assume that the system infers something about what I'm trying to do and jumps ahead and does it for me. This is always fraught with danger because it may be mis-anticipating uh, my needs. And it also conflicts with control. What are some popular examples of software at the moment? That, that tries to anticipate your needs and jumps ahead. Autofill, uh, autofill code, yeah. So autocompletes, right, is the most notorious uh, example of this. Again, like closed captioning, it took a lot of machine learning to get that right. I type in TH, what is the ending of that word? Not an easy thing, not an easy thing uh, to do. As Bryce mentions, uh, the uh, predictive professional email writing software is eerily good. Eer that's a great example, eerily good. Why does it seem so good? We'll get to that when we talk about cognitive psychology, but for now, it's enough to remember that thinking about thinking is misleading, which means that the way that we see our behavior is often not quite the way that we... Actually, let me rephrase that. Thinking about thinking is misleading. In the case of email, you might assume that every email you write is unique, but I know in my case at least that 90% of the emails I write is a one-word email that says, yes, no, good, go ahead, that's fine, here's the filled-in form, yes, yes, good, great, no, the, the diversity of emails that people write is much less than what they think they write because thinking about thinking, or in this case, thinking about behavior, thinking about writing emails is often not what we think. And so it seems eerily good. How could predictive uh, email writing software be so good? It's not because the software is so great. We're making, um, we're misunderstanding our own behavior. We'll come back to that when we talk about cognitive psychology. Yep, auto updating, that's another great example. It anticipates that I'm okay with a software update. Again, notoriously difficult to get right because of context. There are certain times of the day or particular days of the week or particular days in which that it, I do not want the system to be updating software. And for it to be able to predict that is particularly difficult. We're spending a lot of time talking about this because uh, these things require machine learning, which you're already tackling now in Deliverable 4. What features of, the, of interaction should a system be learning from in order to predict what to do, how to autofill a word or how to complete an email? In the case of the IRIS data set that you're working with this week, there are four features, and those features were identified by an expert botanist that you need those four features to be able to predict what species a flower belongs to. Imagine you're trying to write some auto-update code where the prediction is just zero or one. Zero meaning it is not okay right now to update software, or one, it is okay to update software right now. 
That's the class, zero or one, okay to update, not okay to update. What are the features? Not an easy thing to know. Some of those features may not be in the system themselves. They, the computer may not be able to see those features. This is one of the most difficult aspects of machine learning, which is known as um, a feature, feature engineering. So how do I actually pick the features in the first place? Very difficult to do. Takes us from HCI and packed analysis, understanding activities and contexts into machine learning. Okay, we also hope that software is taciturn about its personal problems. Uh, in the old days, uh, computers would flash up on the screen. There's been an error, it's error XYZ123. Why would most users care about a particular error code, right? We, if a system uh, ends up crashing, perhaps it would be great if it just silently uh, rebooted itself or silently sought out and, uh, and did an auto update to fix its own problems. I don't want to know about the software's, software's problems. Okay, uh, it should stay focused. It should be fudgeable. This brings us back to autocomplete. Uh, in the old days, you had to write type everything exactly as is into a computer. That's still true if you're coding the computer, but it's not true so much for most other features that most uh, common users do with the computer. If I search for a term in Google, it's perfectly fine if I misspell that word. Search is now fudgeable. Okay. Okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to end uh, lecture five today with this table. And normally, if we were in class together, we'd fill out this table. But I think we'll do this in chat. Here are the twelve design principles that we just talked about, and we already talked about a few examples of applications or websites where this is done well or poorly. I want us all to collectively brainstorm in this and type in some examples into chat. So the way I'd like you to do this is to, for example, say. Um, visibility um, well and give uh, as you can see in the chat there so I'm giving an answer I'm, I'm giving the example of application XYZ which I think is a great example um, that uh, demonstrates its function uh, makes its functions visible well I could type in visibility poor and give another application of an example where I think visibility is not done particularly well. So we'll just do this as an open brainstorming session. Please pick any of the 12 design features, uh, design principles. Think about some examples of where those design principles are implemented well or poorly and just go ahead and type that into chat and let's see what you uh, come up with. We'll take a minute or two for, for this activity. Okay, Craigslist notoriously famous for not having great uh, great style. So conceptual consistency across all of uh, Google's uh, applications is a great example, right? They all look very very similar. So visibility has been done well by Google. Obviously, Google tried to keep things very simple for a long time and just made the four or five features that it has available uh, relatively visible because everything else on the screen was just white space. GitHub, if you know how to uh, navigate Git particularly well, there's lots of different ways you can go about maintaining or extending yours or somebody else's code base. Yeah. I don't know Bing so well, but I have to have, go have a look. 
I'll take uh, Joseph's word for it. UVM's website has good visibility. Good, good to hear. Okay. I don't know the Penny Juice website. I'll just have to go check that one out. So feedback in an IDE. So Nolan, uh, that's a great example. Exactly. So before I compile or run my code, can you make visible or project affordances about where there are obvious errors or possibly parts of the code that I could improve? Okay, some good examples here of things I haven't seen before. Okay, yeah, poor navigation in Facebook. I think I'd agree with that one. Okay, so um, I think we'll move on at the moment. Uh, I think, again, some of these concepts, like a lot of things in HCI, they seem obvious when you think about them, but implementing them well in a system and implementing not just one of these, but several of these, or even all 12 of these design principles, getting them right in a, in a system and getting them right in a sense that it makes the system uh, accessible, uh, acceptable, engaging to the users, to a, a diversity of users is extremely difficult, takes a lot of practice, and is what HCI is really uh, all about. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, we will stop there for now. And we'll move on now to lecture six, where we're gonna focus particularly on visual design. So designing a way to project uh, a lot of information. And as you can see here, if it wasn't clear, the, re the reading uh, beautiful evidence is associated with lecture six. Okay. Okay, so in visual design, we are usually taking a data set or some corpus of information and trying to find a way to communicate that as a whole to the user. This is a rapidly exploding part of HCI because of the data delu deluge that we're currently in. Every, uh, the amount of information that our species produces on the internet is growing exponentially. There is not just more information out there, but there is more diverse kinds of information. So back to packed analysis, when we are participating in visual design, we are assuming that the user is trying to perform some activity, and that activity is usually to extract patterns from the data in some way. We want to be able to visualize or analyze that data in a visual manner and extract pattern from it. That is the activity which is going to inform all our decisions about how we present information visually to the user. Okay, so what do we need to think about then when we're thinking about the data? Well, first of all, there's a lot of it. So most of the time we're not presenting the data in a raw form. We are aggregating it, taking averages, collapsing it, uh, showing quartiles or quintiles. What are the different ways that we need to basically abstract out the core of a very large data set? We may be looking at very different classes of data, data that is uh, stored at different time resolutions, spatial resolutions. Are we dealing with subjective data, so from a social network, for example, or are we dealing with objective data, uh, numbers that correspond to actual facts out there in the world? Does that influence the way that we visualize that information? What do we know about the quality of the data? Is there, are there mistakes in there? Uh, last, last time when we were talking about KNN, someone uh, mentioned outliers, right? So often we have a bunch of data that's clumped up and potentially is showing us a pattern, but we may have outliers that are pulling the mean or the average in different directions. How do we deal with outliers when we're thinking about projecting that data visually to our uh, observers? Are we dealing with conceptual data? So data that is actually abstract. It's, we're, we're visually presenting numbers where each number doesn't correspond to something that you can touch, for example, income per capita. Does that affect how we go about representing the data? Alternatively, uh, are, we, are we visualizing numbers that are drawn from actual things out there uh, in the world? 
Most importantly, are we presenting just the data itself or are we also presenting the data that is about the data itself, known as metadata? This one is particularly important because even though the amount of data or information that our species is generating on the internet, even though that is growing exponentially, the amount of metadata tags around the data is growing even faster. Here's a, here's a simple example uh, of this. So here's uh, a tweet, and tweets are often stored in uh, JavaScript ob object notation, otherwise known as JSON. So if we take a tweet and we open it up and we look at the data structure that stores that tweet, you'll notice that there is much more information here than the actual 140 characters of the tweet itself. So this is often a counterintuitive observation. You'd think that a piece of data and certain tags about where and when that data was recorded, the tags themselves would be smaller than the data itself. Not, not true. Okay. So what are some of the main strategies? How do we take our thinking about who wants to see the data, P, what are they trying to do by looking at that data, activity A? What's the context of the data uh, itself? Perhaps it's data about COVID uh, or Black Lives Matter. These are uh, very sensitive topics. People are emotionally invested in the data itself. The way we present that information uh, may, may greatly influence the acceptability of the visualization or what we are trying to, to do with the user. Okay. Uh, here's a local example. Uh, some of you may have taken classes with Professor Dodds or Professor Danforth in the math department. Um, Dodds and Danforth have become famous over the last few years for creating what they call the hedonometer, uh, which I can type into chat here. If you haven't seen this before, you can go to hedonometer.org uh, and see this particular visualization. Uh, Dodds and Danforth uh, entered into a special agreement uh, with this up-and-coming company called Twitter uh, back in 2007, six or seven, I think, where they got special access at that time to the Twitter garden hose. And the Twitter garden hose provides you, the recipient, with 10 per a random selection of 10% of all tweets issued that day. There's also the fire hose which is 100% of all tweets issued every day, which Twitter has access to and just a few other organizations do. So given the garden hose, uh, professors Dodds and Danforth uh, with their students created this particular visualization, which scans every word in each tweet, which scans every, let me back up for a moment, which scans uh, all of the tweets in the garden hose, picks out each word and measures the affect of that word, which is how happy or how sad is that word. And this is something that's been determined by users, uh, by uh, a psychology study earlier. So um, for example, if we look at this particular tweet, uh, the word future for most people is um, kind of a, a positive word. Maybe not so much anymore, but generally speaking for English speakers, future is a kind of positive word. Vision, vision is a very po uh, positive word for and the and our, our are neutral words. Um, there's nothing in here that's a negative word. I think the most, uh, the word with the most negative affect in the English language is suicidal, or it used to be. So they take all the tweets, they measure, uh, for each word they assign a number, which is how positive or how negative the affect of that word is and take the average of all words in all those tweets for that day and the average affect, which is the vertical height here, that's where they drop the point. You'll notice a bunch of these positive spikes in very regular frequencies once per year, which corresponds to Christmas Day. Uh, you'll see a lot of these uh, very negative spikes as well. What else does this visualization tell you about the massive data set, which is the Twitter garden hose. What other design decisions did Dodd and Dodds and Danforth and their students make in abstracting away or compressing all of that data to communicate certain facts to the observer? Another way to think about this, what are some aspects of this data 
that are clear from this visualization that would not have been clear by just reading through the Twitter garden hose. Christmas is always happy, so most people wish each other a Merry Christmas or a Happy Christmas the same time every year, makes sense. So the holidays are very clear here. So if you look on the positive, the, the positive spikes, you can see they occur at regular frequencies. The negative spikes do not have any regular frequency, right? So these are disasters. Uh, terrible things that happen that are out of out of the control of human beings we can't set their frequency positive spikes happen at a regular frequency negative spikes don't in retrospect that may be obvious but it's clearly it's vis it's clearly visible in this visualization and that's again the point of good visual design it makes things uh, obvious that would not be so obvious from looking at the raw uh, data uh, as Matthew mentions, we can see the total amount of tweets uh, in the inset at the bottom. What are some other particularly subtle features of this data set that become obvious when they're drawn in this way? So we can see that there are certain patterns um, each year, like the positive spikes. Are there some patterns that are unfolding at a longer temporal scale than a year? How is the, how is the garden hose changing? How has it been changing over the years? not just from day to day or week to week. One of the most obvious long-term trends is that the number of users is increasing. Although there was a very long period in which the volume of tweets stayed relatively the same, and as we entered the COVID era, you can see there the volume of tweets has increased greatly. You'll also notice this very slow sinusoidal uh, pattern showing a very long-term waxing and waning in the positivity or negativity of the tweets. This could be an artifact of Twitter itself, or this might be a reflection of some very long time scale uh, social dynamic. Not immediately clear at the moment. Okay, you can go and 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 play around with. Uh, it seems to vary more. It seems to vary more after 2016. Uh, that's true. You'll notice that things seem to be getting a little bit more volatile on Twitter in terms of affect after 2016 again may represent an actual phenomenon which in the u.s at least makes sense um, but uh, it could also be an artifact of twitter itself okay so um, how do we go about presenting huge amounts of information what are some of the strategies that went on in the construction of the hedonometer or other visualizations we're going to spend uh, a lot of time today talking about Edward Tufta. Um, he is now an emeritus professor uh, from Yale. And uh, the reading for today, Beautiful Evidence, comes from one of his most famous uh, books. We'll talk about his books in a moment. In his first book, um, he pointed out the most obvious strategy is simplify, right? We can't draw all, uh, we can't draw all 200 million times 3,000 tweets, we have to compress the data somehow. But we have to be careful because some of the details that are lost during compression may be of interest to a given user. Again, we need to think about who is observing the visualization. 
We might need to systematize the data somehow, put them all, put the data all in the same format, like for example, uh, a JSON, JSON files to ease searching, to ease compression. But again, if we're systematizing data and putting it in the same format, we may be losing information when we move things from one format uh, to another. On the flip side, we can't draw all the raw data uh, because the user is not able to pull out a global pattern. So how do we strike a balance between simplification and providing sufficient information to see patterns? One of the ways to strike this balance is to use metaphors wherever we can, where users transform their into transfer their intuitions about the physical world or the social world to the conceptual world. And we've talked about this several times before. Let's take two different kinds uh, of processes. Spread. Spread itself is a metaphor. How might we visualize on Google Maps, for example, the spread of an idea versus the spread of a disease like AIDS uh, or COVID? They're very similar, the spreading of an idea or the spreading of a disease, but they're also different how might that, the, the differences between those two phenomena, ideas and diseases, how might that influence uh, slightly different visualizations? So for example, let's imagine there's an appearance of a new popular meme and we'd like to visualize on Google Maps where that meme started and how it spread. How might you go about creating a visualization to track the beginnings of a new meme versus tracking the spreading of a new disease? Think about the contexts of those two things. How might that inform your visual design to show the spread of those concepts, or the spread of those phenomena. Think about the observer. If, some, if you wanted to visualize the spread of a meme or the spread of a disease, what would you want to see in the visualization? What's important to you? What patterns are you looking for? So most diseases spread through human contact in some way. So disease, you might want better location resolution. Maybe you're worried about whether the disease is spread to where you are. Let's think about the differences between these things. Diseases spread by physical contact or at least physical proximity. Memes do not necessarily spread based on physical uh, contact or physical proximity. How do memes spread differently from diseases? Ideas spread mainly through the internet. So maybe Google Maps is not the best choice for visualizing the spread of a meme. Maybe we create some visual representation of the internet and show the spread of a meme through uh, a bunch of connected popular websites. In the case of a disease, we might actually show uh, Google Maps. But on both of those different maps, map of the world, map of the internet, we may come up with certain visual metaphors that show spread, right? So red shows a lot of infection of that meme or that idea at that particular place. Um, perhaps we have growing circles that show uh, uh, where the animation is showing um, uh, how something is moving or spreading through time. So we might use the same visual widgets or visual components superimposed on different maps because of the differences in the way these spread. So different, different concepts, but the same metaphor.
Okay. Again, however, we want to make sure that everybody gets the metaphor, right? So growing red circles, shrinking green circles. Would everyone understand what that means if we're showing them the spread of a meme or the spread of a disease? Okay, so we have 15 minutes left, and I think we'll spend these 15 minutes um, watching um, one of the earliest and probably one of the most famous TED Talks. This was given by uh, Hans Rosling, the actual creator of Gapminder. So uh, I think it runs for about 20 minutes, so I guess we'll watch the first uh, 15 minutes. What I'd like you to do as you're watching the TED Talk is I want you to write down uh, four different things. I want you to keep track as uh, Professor Rossling is talking about what are the conceptual objects that are introduced. He's going to talk about a lot of abstract things that you can't physically touch, gross national product, uh, AIDS, education issues, aspects of health and wealth. And what, uh, what are the overall strategies that he uses to visualize those abstract concepts? In some cases he's going to show graphs, animations. Um, third thing I want you to pay attention to are what are the visual building blocks of those graphs or animations. Where does he use circles? Where does he use areas, heights, colors, lines, animations? And why did he chose, choose those constructs for those conceptual objects? I want you also to listen to how he describes Gapminder. In his speaking, he's going to use a lot of uh, metaphor. So for example, he's going to show at some point um, the quote unquote closing in of China compared to the US. How does that metaphor, that, uh, metaphor how is that metaphor brought to life in Gapminder? We've already seen a few of these metaphors already. There are many in this, in this TED talk. I want you to also pay attention, although you can only see Rossling, uh, to the response of the crowd. You get a sense of how accessible or engaging uh, Gapminder is from the, the positive responses of the crowd. So um, I'll, start the, I'll start the video. Please do try and note down uh, aspects of these four things from the video. And we'll stop the video at 9.45 and then talk about it next time. Well, 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our... Can everybody hear the video okay? About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pretest when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> But one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> 
So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? And they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life and small family. And third world is short life and large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries they had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world and this is all UN statistic that has been available. Here we go, can you see there? It's China, they are moving against better health, they are improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families but they no longer life but not larger families the Africans are the green down here they still remain here this is India Indonesia is moving on pretty fast and in the 80s here you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there but not Bangladesh it's a miracle that happens in the 80s the imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner and in 90s we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Let me make a comparison directly between United States of America and Vietnam, 1964. America had small families and long life Vietnam had large families and short lives, and this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families. And the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 80s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy and it moves faster even than social life and today we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam 19, 2003 as in United States 1974 by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia which was in social change before we saw the economical change. So let's move over to another way here in which we could display the distribution in the world of the income. This is the world distribution of income of people. One dollar, ten dollar or one hundred dollar per day. There's no gap between rich and poor any longer. This is a myth. There's a little hump here. Huh? But there are people all the way. And if we look where the income ends up, huh? The income, this is 100% of world's annual income. And the richest 20%, they take out of that about 74%. And the poorest 20%, they take about 2%. And this shows that the concept developing countries is extremely doubtful. We sort of think about aid, like these people here, giving aid to these people here. But in the middle, we have most of the world population, uh, and they have now 24% of the income. We heard it in other forms. Uh, and who are, who are these, these? Where are the different countries? Uh, I can show you Africa. This is 
Africa. 10% of the world population most in poverty. This is OECD, uh, the rich country, the country club of the UN. And they are over here on this side and quite an overlap between Africa and OECD. And this is Latin America. It has everything on this earth from the poorest to the richest in Latin America. And on top of that, we can put East Europe, we can put East Asia, and we could South Asia. And how did it look like if we go back in time to about 1970? Then there was more of a hump. Huh? And we have most who lived in absolute poverty were Asians. The problem in the world was the poverty in Asia. And if I now let the world move forward, you will see that while population increase, there are hundreds of millions in Asia getting out of poverty and some others get into poverty. And this is the pattern we have today. And the best projection from the World Bank is that this will happen. And we will not have a divided world. We will have most people in the middle. Of course, it's a logarithmic scale here. But our concept of economy is growth with percent. We look upon it as a possibility of percent and increase. If I change this and I take GDP per capita instead of family income and I turn these uh, individual data into regional data of gross domestic product and I take the regions down here, the size of the bubble is still the population and you have the OECD there and you have Sub-Saharan Africa there and we take off the Arab states there coming both from Africa and from Asia and we put them separately and we can expand this axis and I can give it a new dimension here by adding uh, the social values there, child survival. Now I have money on that axis and I have the possibility of children to survive there. In some countries, 99.7% of children survive to five years of age, others only 70. And here it seems that there is a gap between OECD, Latin America, East Europe, East Asia, Arab states, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The linearity is very strong between child survival and money. But let me split Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, health is there and better uh, health is up there. I can go here and I can split Sub-Saharan Africa into its countries. And when it bursts, the size of East country bubble is the size of the population. Sierra Leone down there, Mauritius up there. Mauritius was the first country to get away with trade barriers and they could sell their sugar, they could sell their textiles on equal terms as the people in Europe and North America. There's a huge difference between Africa and Ghana is here in the middle. In Sierra Leone, humanitarian aid, here in uh, Uganda, development aid, here time to invest, there you can go for holiday. Uh, it's a tremendous variation within Africa, which we very often make that it's equal everything. I can split South Asia here, India's the big bubble in the middle, but huge difference between Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. And I can split Arab states, how are they? Same climate, same culture, same religion, huge difference, even between neighbors, Yemen civil war, United Arab Emirates money, which was quite equally and well used, not as the myth is. And that includes all the children of the foreign workers who are in the country. Data is often better than you think. Many people say that data is bad. There is an uncertainty margin. But we can see the difference here, Cambodia, Singapore. The differences are much bigger than the weakness of the data. East Europe, Soviet economy for a long time, but they come out after 10 years very, very differently. And there is Latin America. Today, we don't have to go to Cuba to find a healthy country in Latin America. Chile will have a lower child mortality than Cuba within some few years from now. And here we have high income countries in OECD and we get the whole pattern here of the world, which is more or less like, like this. And if we look at it, how it looks the world in 1960, it starts to move 1960. This is Mao Zedong, he brought health to China. And then he died, and then Deng Xiaoping came and brought money to China and brought them into the mainstream again. And we have seen how countries move in different directions like this. So it's sort of, sort of difficult to get an example country which shows the pattern of the world. But I would like to bring you back to about here at uh, 1960. Uh, and I would like to compare uh, um, South Korea, which is this one, with, with Brazil, which is this one, 
the label went away for me here and i would like to compare uganda which is there huh? and i can run it forward like this huh? and you can see how south korea is making a very very fast advancement whereas brazil is much slower and if we move back again here and we put on Okay, I think we will pause there for today. We'll watch the remainder of this TED Talk. Clearly, this is a historical artifact at this point. There are many, uh, there's several more and more recent TED Talks by Professor Rosling. Uh, just a reminder, you have a quiz uh, due tonight at 11.59 p.m., and I hope to see some of you at uh, CS Research Day tomorrow. Uh, thanks very much, and otherwise, uh, I'll see you for office hours or see you back here Tuesday morning. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.